in this section of notes, we are going to discuss phase changes and how much energy you need to change the phase of a particular substance. Now remember, a phase change is when you go from one state to another. So you're going to take a substance from one state to another by adding or removing energy. Now we do have to be careful here. Phase changes only occur at specific temperatures. So if you take an ice cube from the freezer, it's frozen inside of the freezer because the temperature inside of the freezer's freezer is below the melting point of the ice cube. You take it out of the freezer and it doesn't instantaneously turn into a puddle of water because first the ice cube has to heat up to its melting point and then energy can go into actually melting the ice cube. So it isn't an instantaneous thing. And we're gonna learn how to calculate how much energy is needed to first raise the temperature up to the melting point and then how much energy is actually required to melt the entire ice cube. All right, so we're gonna look at this in graph form. So I'm gonna take a graph And we're going to put temperature on the y-axis and energy on the x-axis. So we're going to start in the solid phase. You don't necessarily have to start in the solid phase. However, you can use this entire graph and then put your initial point where it needs to be and your final point where it needs to be. So we're going to start at some initial temperature. And as you add energy, the temperature is going to increase up until you hit the melting point. So this is going to be in the solid phase. And we would use the mass times the specific heat times the change in temperature in order to establish what the heat needed in order to do that temperature change. Once we raise the substance's temperature up to the melting point, all of the energy is then going to go into melting. And phase changes are isothermal, meaning that they occur at the same temperature. All of the energy is going into actually taking it from a solid to a liquid state, so doing what you need to do with the different types of bonds in between the individual atoms of the substance rather than dealing with the vibrations and making it vibrate more. So we're going to note over here that phase changes Alright, so how exactly then do we calculate the energy needed in order to do the phase change? Because we can't use the same formula anymore because the change in temperature is zero. So the formula we're going to use is our heat is going to equal the mass of the substance times the latent heat of fusion. And these are going to be found in the table in your textbook. And you do have to be careful. The units here need to be in joules per kilogram. Because the latent heat is the energy needed to raise one kilogram of the substance through its phase change. Alright, so once the phase change has occurred, the energy can go now back into changing the temperature of the substance. 
So here we're going to be a liquid and we're going to use mass times specific heat times the change in temperature. And now our change in temperature, the temperature will raise up to the boiling point. And the boiling point is when we have our phase change between a liquid and a gas. And note that for a lot of substances, the specific heat of the solid and the specific heat of the liquid are different. So when you look in your table in the textbook, you'll notice that ice and water have two different specific heats. So now we're going to undergo another phase change. And this phase change is going to be from a liquid to a gas. So that involves a different latent heat. So our subscript now here is going to be V, where back here is M times LF. And our relationship really hasn't changed. We're just using a different latent heat. Where this is the latent heat of vaporization. Once the substance has completely changed phase, then any energy added to the system will go into raising the temperature. So of MC temperature final minus the boiling point. And once again, most likely the specific heat here is different. So the specific heat of steam is different than for water is different for ice. So not only do you have to keep track of what phase you're in to use the correct specific heat, but also then uh, where your phase changes are going to occur based upon what temperature you're at. So in your LinkedIn Blackboard, uh, in the left-hand menu is the latent heats, and the latent heats include latent heat of fusion, latent heat of vaporization for different substances, and it also includes the melting and the boiling points for you as well. Now there's one other thing I do need to mention. Whenever you're doing changes in temperature, whether it's an increase or a decrease in energy is going to be based upon that change in temperature. So when you're just raising the temperature or lowering the temperature, you don't have to worry about minus signs for heat. That's going to come out of the delta T. But there's no delta in these formulas, so you do have to keep track of whether you're adding energy to the system or removing energy from the system during the phase change. So as you're going from a solid to a liquid, or a liquid to a gas, that's going to be a positive phase change. But if you're trying to go the opposite direction, where you're trying to go from a gas to a liquid, a less energetic state, you would use a negative m times LV. Or if you're trying to go from a liquid to a solid, you would use a negative m times LF. I encourage you guys, as you are doing problems, to make use of a graph like the one I've drawn here. And you can draw the entire thing. You don't have to label everything. Usually when I do these, I typically just draw these, this structure. And then I'll label where I'm starting and where I'm ending. So for example, if instead of starting in the solid phase, I'm starting in the liquid phase. So my temperature initial would be here. That then changes what this is, because that's T initial. And then if my final temperature here is in the gas, that means that I would go through use this, but with Ti being instead of the melting point, this would remain the same, and this would remain the same. So this is allowing you to calculate how much energy you have to add in order to go from the initial point where you would need this Q, this Q, and then this Q to deal with that particular substance, to get it from some initial temperature through the phase change to some final temperature. It actually requires three Q values. And you would then insert this into one of the examples that we did earlier, whether it's finding total energy or into a calorimetry problem where you might have something like an ice cube at some initial temperature, 
you dump some water on top of it and then you want to know what the final temperature is as a liquid so you would start down here in the solid and you would have to establish it's going to take a certain amount of energy to raise it up to the melting point a certain amount of energy to then melt it and if there's any energy left over it goes into raising the temperature actually as water now because you melted the ice cube so in your calorimetry problem if you have a calorimeter with an ice cube inside and you dump hot water on it you actually need three cues to deal with the ice cube and then one cue to deal with the hot water because hot water is not going to change phase because it's just giving its energy to the ice cube. 